Welcome everyone, my name is Zach, and in this video, I'm going to test whether or not electric cars are any good at high altitude mountain driving. For this test, I'm gonna drive from the Denver area, starting at about 5,800 feet in elevation, up to the top of the Continental Divide at Loveland Pass, which is more than two miles above sea level, or more than 12,000 feet in elevation. The primary focus of this video is efficiency and whether or not electric cars are practical in these situations, or if the drastic elevation changes reduce efficiency so much that they are unrealistic as a recreational vehicle and should be left in the cities for commuting. Okay, so the plan for the test is a big out and back trip with tons of elevation changes. I will be using my long range dual motor Tesla Model 3 with aero covers on the 18 inch wheels and going with the flow of traffic. Starting in the Denver area, I'm then gonna drive 76 miles to Silverthorne, Colorado. This is a steady climb from 5,800 feet in elevation up to 11,000 feet before descending down to Silverthorne at 9,000 feet in elevation. From there, I'm gonna drive 17 miles up to the Continental Divide at Loveland Pass. This is a pretty steep climb from 9,000 feet up to 12,000 feet in elevation. And then I'm gonna do the reverse and drive the 17 miles back down to the same point in Silverthorne. And then from Silverthorne, I'm gonna drive the same 76 mile route back to the Denver area and conclude the test. I'll be stopping in Silverthorne before and after heading up to the top of Loveland Pass so we can assess efficiency each step of the way as well as once the entire 186 mile test is complete. Okay, so I started this test down in the Denver area at an elevation of about 5,800 feet and it was about 90 degrees outside. And luckily I remembered to reset my trip meter so that I would get overall data of the entire test. But here I am heading west on I-70 for the first leg of this journey. And it's a pretty steady climb on this road up to the Eisenhower Tunnel, which is at an elevation of about 11,000 feet, actually making it the highest vehicular tunnel in the United States. But that also means that I have to gain a mile of elevation just to get to this point. And I actually chose the route for this test based on the fact that it's quite representative of going hiking or camping or skiing while living in the Denver area. And with all of the steep grades should be a great test for efficiency while driving in the mountains. And if you follow electric vehicles, you know that efficiency is king, since energy density of batteries is considerably less than in gas. The 75 kilowatt hour battery pack in the Model 3 is equivalent to only 2.23 gallons of gas when comparing the energy density. But electric motors are much more efficient at converting that energy into movement compared to combustion engines. But this also means that changes in efficiency are much more noticeable on electric cars. And that's why things like aerodynamics and tires and temperature can have such a big impact on your range. So for this leg of the test, I was also using autopilot for the majority of the time. And I'm going to make a separate video about how autopilot does on windy mountain roads like this. Okay, so now we're really starting to climb up to the Eisenhower Tunnel, which actually cuts straight through a mountain at 11,000 feet and comes out on the other side of the Continental Divide. And for those of you that don't know, the Continental Divide is a divide for water drainage in North America, meaning that all water on the east side of this line flows into the Atlantic Ocean or Gulf of Mexico, and all water on the west side flows into the Pacific Ocean. And the only other way to pass the Continental Divide in this area is over Loveland Pass, which we'll be going up later. But the tunnel was built to replace Loveland Pass to lead to a safer and shorter journey across the Continental Divide in this section of Colorado. Okay, so here we are at 11,000 feet going through the tunnel, and then going into a steep downhill for about 10 miles before our first stop in Silverthorne, where we drop about 2,000 feet of elevation to bring us down to 9,000 feet. And this is really the first time during this test that I'm able to utilize the regenerative braking capabilities of electric vehicles. And I think this is a total game changer when it comes to mountain driving, but I'll talk more about that later. But we've made it to our first stop, and I'm going to plug in at a supercharger while I get something set up and review the efficiency data so far. So I have to say I was very surprised at how well the car did during the first 76 miles of this test. My car only used 22 kilowatt hours to drive this distance, resulting in an efficiency of 283 watt hours per mile. And at this rate, I could travel 265 miles on a full charge. And if you wanna know how to calculate this, you just take your battery size and divide it by that efficiency number. So for my Tesla Model 3, I have a 75 kilowatt hour battery pack, which is equivalent to 75,000 watt hours. So 75,000 divided by 283 is 265 miles. And doing the same math in reverse, since the EPA has rated that this car has a range of 322 miles, that means that the EPA rated efficiency is 233 watt hours per mile. And I think only losing 57 miles of range, considering how much climbing we just did, was actually a pretty good result. Okay, so now we're making our way up to Loveland Pass. And we're gonna go from 9,000 feet above sea level to almost 12,000 feet above sea level in just 16 miles. And it's a pretty steep climb with an average grade of 6% with a peak grade of 9%. 
Loveland Pass is one of the highest mountain passes in the United States and is the highest mountain pass in Colorado that stays open year round. So while we're on the way up here, I want to talk about one of the advantages to driving at high elevation. Earlier I was talking about how electric vehicle design focuses heavily on efficiency. And the biggest impact for efficiency on electric vehicles is aerodynamics. At high speeds, aerodynamic drag is the largest force trying to slow down your vehicle. And aerodynamic drag increases exponentially with speed, which is why EVs are actually more efficient at lower speeds. But the big advantage to driving at high elevation is that the air is thinner, resulting in less aerodynamic drag. In Denver alone, the air is about 20% thinner compared to sea level. And at 12,000 feet, the air is about 35% thinner. And this is going to reduce the amount of energy required to move the car through the air and hopefully help compensate for the steep hills. The only potential downside that I can imagine for an electric vehicle due to the thinner air is that there's less air for cooling. However, it's generally much cooler at these higher elevations, so I can't see it making much of a difference in reality. Okay, now we're starting to get to the fun part of this road where it gets really steep with tons of switchbacks. And that brings me to a big advantage that electric vehicles have over gas vehicles in this thinner air. Electric motors don't need to breathe air like combustion engines do in order to operate. But first, check out this vehicle. So a normal gas car loses about 3% of their horsepower for every 1,000 feet above sea level that they are. And if you've ever driven at high elevation, you know exactly how significant this can feel. At 10,000 feet, that's 30% of your power. And at these extremes, combustion engine cars are often running in really low gears at high RPMs just to find the power to make it up the hill. Now turbocharged gas cars will fare a little better because they have forced air induction, but the difference is still going to be very noticeable. But electric cars have no problems with loss of power or torque at high elevation. Also, if you're wondering what the deal is with all these tall poles on the side of the road, those are actually markers for snow plows, so in the winter, they know where the road is. Yeah, they get a lot of snow up here. But this is it, we've made it to the top of Loveland Pass at 11,990 feet above sea level. But before I look at the efficiency numbers, I'm gonna grab my camera, take some footage, and try not to get blown off of this mountain. So wish me luck. Okay, let's look at the energy that we used to get up here. So we used 503 watt hours per mile for a total of eight kilowatt hours over the 17 miles, which means that at this rate, I would only be getting 149 miles of range on a full charge, which is certainly not great, but let's see how we fare going down the same road. The ability to use regenerative braking on the way down the mountain has two huge benefits here. First off, you're able to use the electric motors to slow down and actually recover energy into your battery pack that would otherwise just be turned into waste heat on your brakes. A gas car would have to coast down here in a low gear and still use their brakes. And sure, they're not actually burning gas as they go down, but an electric car can actually add range to its battery pack. The other big advantage is that you don't actually have to use your brakes at all. Throughout this entire test, I never had to use my brakes to slow down going down a hill once, even on these tight switchbacks here. And that's a huge deal when it comes to safety. If you've ever driven down a mountain pass like this and been primarily using your brakes to slow down and not engine braking, then you know exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about brake fade. Brakes slow a car down with friction. They turn kinetic energy into heat and they work best at colder temperatures. So if you're using your brakes a lot going down a hill like this, your brakes are gonna increase in temperature significantly and when they increase in temperature, they provide less and less stopping power. And sometimes they can even fail, which is why on steep mountain passes, you see runaway truck ramps. So basically, if you don't have to use your brakes to slow down going downhill because you're using regenerative braking, then you still have maximum stopping power available in the event that you have to do some form of emergency braking. And the impact that regenerative braking has on your stress level while mountain driving is incredible and was one of the biggest surprises for me. It's so relieving to not be constantly worried about which gear you should be in and whether or not you're using your brakes too much. But let's speed back to that supercharger in Silverthorn and see how much of an impact the regenerative braking had on my efficiency on the way down. Mm -hmm. 
Whew, pretty lucky I didn't get pulled over there. But in my defense, everyone was going that speed. Just check the video. All right, joking aside, let's look at the efficiency numbers from the trip up Loveland Pass and back down. So we went 33.4 miles, but only used eight kilowatt hours of energy with an average efficiency of 240 watt hours per mile. And at that rate, I could go 312 miles on a full charge, which is only 10 miles off of the rated range of the Tesla Model 3 long range dual motor. And that's very impressive considering we went up 3000 feet and then back down. Okay, so there's only one segment of this test left and that's driving the 76 miles back down I-70 to the Denver area. And that will give us the total round trip efficiency numbers. But since it was getting dark and you've already seen this drive on the way out, we're just gonna skip all the way home and look at the final efficiency numbers. Okay, so I made it home and finished the test. The final 76 miles were mostly downhill and I did 70 to 75 miles per hour most of the time on the highway. And looking at the overall numbers from this test, I have to say that I'm pretty surprised. Over the entire 186 miles, I only used 43 kilowatt hours with an efficiency of 229 watt hours per mile. And that means that I actually exceeded the EPA rated range of this car and at this rate would get 327 miles on a full charge. Okay, so now let's try to break down why the results of this test were so good. First off, I think the thin air really makes a difference. The efficiency of electric vehicles decreases pretty rapidly as speed increases, and the thinner air allows you to go faster while maintaining efficiency. And I think the added energy consumption of climbing mountains was offset by the thinner air and lower drag. Another big factor is regenerative braking. It's pretty impressive how much energy this can put back into your battery pack when you're going down a steep hill. I think a takeaway from this test is that if you're gonna go up and down a mountain, I think you can expect to get around the rated range of your vehicle. However, I wouldn't expect that if you're just driving to the top of a mountain. It really has to be a round trip where you're going up and down to get the range. Now, a couple quick notes about environmental conditions. It was a little windy along the route, but since it was an out and back trip, I think that would have a net even effect on the results. The other environmental factor is temperature. It was about 90 degrees in Denver when I started, and the coldest temperatures I saw were about 58 degrees on the top of Loveland Pass. And as far as electric vehicles, these temperatures are great for them. So I really wanna repeat this test in winter to see how the cold weather affects their results. So keep an eye out for that video in the future. So overall, I would argue that electric cars are actually better than gas cars for the scenario and conditions that I just tested. Range was not really affected at all, and with tons of torque, regenerative braking, and no power losses at high altitude, I think an electric car is totally worth bringing on a hike or camping trip in the mountains. But that's all for today. Consider subscribing if you wanna see me repeat this test in the winter to see how cold weather impacts the results. Or if you just wanna learn more about living with an electric vehicle. Regardless, thanks for watching and see you next time.